All right, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Welcome to our biotech and vet med space today, sponsored by Pet Vivo. Given this is a sponsored space and has an advertisement in it, it's important to note some of the terms of the space. So while we kind of prep things and get things rolling, I'm going to go ahead and read through that disclaimer now. It's also pinned at the top of the nest here on the space. This space is not financial advice. Unusual Whales Inc. is not a registered securities broker dealer or an investment advisor with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or any state securities regulatory authority. The stock market is risky, and any trade or investment is expected to have some or total loss. Please do research before taking any trade. Do not use this information for financial decisions or for investing. You should consult your legal or tax professional regarding your specific situation. Of note for this space today, Unusual Whales was paid by Pet Vivo to host this space on topics relating to biotech and veterinary medicine. Additionally, Unusual Whales is not responsible for any promotion. It does not verify the authenticity of the promotion or partnership, nor the merits of the individual promotion. There's no endorsement of any one promotion. As with trades, do your own diligence and research before following any one promoted post. Don't consider a promotion of a post to be advocacy for the sponsor of the post. Nothing discussed should be construed as an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy, or a recommendation for any security or any third party. Now, with that said, in today's space, as I mentioned, we're going to cover biotech and its applications in veterinary medicine, as well as the intersections it shares in the markets. Again, today's space was made possible by our sponsor, Pet Vivo. Pet Vivo is a veterinary biotech and biomedical device company primarily engaged in the business of translating or adapting human biotech and medical technology into products for commercial sale in the veterinary market to help companion animals such as dogs and horses suffering from arthritis and other afflictions. With their focus on the $11 billion veterinary care market for companion animals, Pet Vivo specializes in a veterinary device called Spring with osteocushion technology aimed at managing lameness and joint-related afflictions like osteoarthritis in animals. They're the paid sponsor of today's space. Now, I'm going to go through introductions for each one of our panelists today, and as those who frequent these spaces know, I like to keep these panels very open for discussion. So as we go, everybody on the panel here today, please feel free to add any thoughts that you may have on a given topic. Feel free to discuss openly. The only request that I have throughout the course of the space is that you keep your microphones muted when others are talking, just to avoid any background noise or echo. Now, with that said, we're very fortunate to have a good handful of speakers well-versed in the worlds of biotech and vet med, as well as how those intersections happen in the markets. Once again, this space is sponsored by Pet Vivo, and to kick off our introductions, we're joined by the CEO and president of Pet Vivo, John Lai. John is the CEO and president and director of today's sponsor, Pet Vivo. He has over 30 years of senior executive experience in various industries. In 1992, he founded the Genesis Capital Group, providing consulting services in corporate development and capital raising. John, thank you so much for lending us your expertise today and sponsoring today's space. Thanks for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on here and glad to be able to uh, support such a good open forum. I appreciate that. And I know you're going to have a lot to say. I have a lot of targeted questions for you today on these topics. Next, we've got the BioFarm Catalyst, who provides key catalyst updates for publicly traded biotech and pharma companies with a database encompassing thousands of catalysts. BPC provides real-time information on companies in the sector and upcoming events, reports, or any other catalyst that investors may need to be up to date on. I'm very happy to have BPC with us today to lend us their biotech investment expertise. Thank you for joining BPC. Thanks a lot, Nick. It's John with BioFarm Catalyst. Really happy to be here and excited for the, uh, for the discussion. Happy to have you, John. Thanks for coming. Next, we've got Viviani, known as Vivi the Bio Queen. 
Viviani is a successful and active trader in the biotech and biopharma sectors with experience working in pharmaceutical sales as well. Vivi uses those experiences and expertise to track bio stocks for investment and also provides information on catalysts when applicable. Excited to have your trading point of view today, Vivi. How are Good. you? Good. How are you guys? Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Really excited to do this one. Next, we've got Dr. Crystal Heath. She is a shelter and general practice veterinarian who places an important emphasis on compassion and humane treatment of animals in practice. Crystal is heavily involved in activism for the humane treatment of animals across sectors. And to that end, Dr. Crystal co-founded Our Honor, a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating an organized network of veterinary professionals to challenge unethical institutionalized systems to help protect animals and practice compassion in the treatment of animals. Thanks for coming and lending us your vet expertise, Crystal. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to talk to these money folks about these things. So um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. As am I, Crystal. Thank you. Last but not least, certainly, we've got Christian Angermeyer. Christian is an investor and entrepreneur within the biotech market sector and founded a Puron Investment Group, a private investment firm focused on life sciences, fintech, future tech, bio, hospitality, and even as he put it, happiness. With over $2.5 billion in assets under management, I'm really excited to have your insight today, Christian, as we navigate what it means to invest in biotech. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me and uh, welcome everybody. All right, everybody. So without much further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. So just to kind of start us off here, John, John Lai, from your point of view, what are, what are the current trends shaping the pet care biotech world and the veterinary industry? And how is it that you at Pet Vivo are positioned to capitalize on these new trends? So what we're seeing out there is a general trend to get away from pharmaceutical products, bio, biologics, because they tend to have side effects. And also, you know, there's a focus on natural products as well as um, more of a driver to understand how to bring costs down because, you know, the, uh, the shortage uh, of veterinary professionals in the field has caused long wait times as well as um, being very more expensive. So how we're, how our product is quite different into the marketplace is in the form of osteoarthritis is we're looking at addressing the root cause of the problem. So spring basically is sold to veterinary doctors. They administered the product through uh, what is called intraarticular injections. And with that, what we have seen uh, is a dramatic reduction in the need for NSAIDs, painkillers, and so on after our product is injected. And how we're unique and different is once it's into the synovium, it actually starts to look and go into the areas where cartilage used to be, and these particles start to form a scaffolding which will mimic the cartilage's function, but it's a purely mechanical function. So it has uh, almost zero side effect because nothing is zero side effect. You can inject saline and some dogs or horses or cats will have some type of reaction, but the number is very low. And by doing it that way, we're actually allowing the animal to benefit of in form of multiple areas in for terms of mobility and so on, because the NSAIDs and everything else is more focused on symptoms. So, so that's the, one of the major differentiation of our product is that it's a longer term approach to looking at the problem versus what is currently out there. And there hasn't really been any innovations within the industry in a lot of years. Everybody just tries to come out with a better pill that has less side effects. But we all know from the human side, as well as the animal health side, that prolonged use of these pills cause gastro tract bleeding, liver and kidney issues. And I've always advocated that by masking pain, you're actually allowing the dog to run and jump in situations that it normally would not. And therefore, 
possibly increasing or speeding up the damage of that existing cartilage. And that's where the dif major differentiator of our product, our product stays in there as a mechanical function where it provides that cushion. I think it's a really good to have. I know from, you know, my own experience with pets that the the risk of toxicity and long-term use of NSAIDs especially can be can be a pretty high concern. Thank you, John. Yep. So to kind of kick things around a bit, I want to touch a little bit on the markets and and sorry if we jump around a bit. A lot of these topics intertwine. And so I'll try to keep things as linear as possible. But again, if anybody has any comments to what any other panelist says, please feel free to chime in once they're done. Now, according to McKinsey and Company, between the years of 2019 and 2021, venture capital companies invested more than $52 billion in therapeutic-based biotech companies worldwide. However, investors in the industry indicate that the biopharma VC craze peaked in 2021, while there's been significant decline since then. VC companies do continue to invest in biotech. So John from BPC, what recent trends have you personally observed in venture capital funding for the biotech sector? Yeah, sure. Happy to touch on that, Nick. Um, so you are definitely correct on in your in your assessment, and the uh, the, the McKinsey report certainly is is accurate when it comes to kind of the shift that we've seen in the landscape. Um, if you take a look at you know just the IPO market alone. Um, we've really only seen about 20 companies or so IPO within this space this year. Um, that's the lowest that we've seen in the last six years. Um, and just for some context, back in 2021, uh, there were about 200 IPOs and uh, merger and acquisition deals that generated close to $86 billion in returns for investors. Um, and, and we are definitely seeing that, that shift. And, and I think you can kind of attribute that to a couple different reasons. There's the obvious macroeconomic factors, right? We've seen um, the rise in interest rates that is going to, um, you know, really kind of crunch down on the lending that we're seeing within the biotech space. Obviously, um, these companies need to, you know, borrow a lot of money for the for the drugs that they're making. So that certainly um, has impacted it. Um, and frankly, um, you know, the, just the regulatory environment in general. I mean, if you guys, m most of you have probably are familiar with how difficult it is to get a drug across the line, um, particularly when it comes to phase two and phase three within the U.S. I mean, some of this is taking 10 to 15 years, right? So um, I think all of that is making it, uh, you know, much more of a challenging environment. Um, and just kind of the fact that it's been very saturated. I mean, we've seen, as, as you had mentioned, I mean, the IPO market was, um, was significantly higher several years ago, and you had a lot of companies flood into the market. And the reality is, is, is that a lot of them, you know, have not done as well as as they thought they would for the for the reasons that that I just mentioned. So I think what we're seeing is, um, from a VC standpoint, a lot more concentrated money. Um, in uh, they're still funding. I, I believe that they still are going to continue to fund a fair amount. But that is going to be concentrated in a, in a fewer number of companies um, that have more specializations, right? Um, so it's it's kind of going to be more of a uh, a quality over quantity game that we've uh, compared to what we've seen in the past. Um, just a couple of areas that we think are 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 hot right now and and going into 2024. Um, companies that are developing, um, you know, uh, drugs for small molecules. Um, and, uh, and, and medicines um, that already have some clinical drug data behind them are, are definitely areas where, um, where VCs are, are looking to invest their money. They don't want to necessarily have to deal with um, too much in the way of something that is completely brand new that has absolutely no drug data behind it um, because I think they've gotten burned on that in the past. And as I mentioned, it does take a long time for these drugs to come to market. Um, I would say, I mean, I know we've, it's kind of a, a, a you know, a, 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 something we've heard so much at this point, but AI, um, AI plays a really, really big role in biotech uh, in terms of developing some of these drugs and these therapies. Um, so a company like Seismic Therapeutics, um, they just got $121 million in funding this month. Um, Evozyne as well, $81 million in September. So I think that that's a trend that's here to stay, identifying companies that are leveraging AI and machine learning for their drugs. Um, and then obviously, you know, 
taking a look at certain designations, orphan drugs for rare diseases, um, things that don't already have a solution, those are always going to be uh, fair areas for, uh, for VC funding. And I think that's what we're going to see uh, more of going into uh, 2024. Thank you, John. And we're definitely going to touch on some more of that a little later. You hit on a lot of points I had questions for. John Lai, I see you unmuted there. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I wanted to talk, you know, I totally agree with the analysis on orphan drugs and small molecules. But one of the things we're seeing out there right now, if you look at the XBI index, which is a small cap biotech index, you're seeing that chart pattern really turn. And the, and the relative valuation to the S&P 500 and the XBI performance has never been this wide. So the opportunity, I think, is telling you that doing the index small cap companies is where you could have relative superior performance going forward with the macro basis of interest rates being stable and probably coming down second half of 2024. But, but we're quite different than those other companies because one of the biggest risks when you're looking at biotech or medical medical device is the regulatory risk. So in our situation, we were funded by NIH and DOD and the science was developed at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And we did get the human medical device designation, which means you don't have to go into phase three, you can do 510Ks and PMAs. But with that designation, I was, we were able to bring it into the animal side of the FDA and be able to get automatically designated as a veterinary medical device. So we didn't have to do any research. So the regulatory risk is greatly reduced in our company. Now it's a matter of commercialization and educating the standard veterinary doctors that you know, went through vet school and learned that it's a multimodal approach when you diagnose osteoarthritis because you go through a whole series of NSAIDs, hydroconic acid, then you follow along stem cells, polyacritamines, then joint replacement. Our approach is basically do the injection of spring and you're probably good for a year and it reduces the need for those other therapies. And sorry to cut in on that macro aspect of the biotech industry, but it's a very important point. And I wanted to say I agree with John is the key areas of small molecule and orphan medical. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. And John, Christian, I see you unmuted. Did you have that? Yeah, I just wanted actually to say what uh, John went on to say, that uh, we have this crazy situation that the biotech, the listed biotech market is, is much more distorted uh, than the venture market, which and we're playing in both worlds. So we have a big uh, venture biotech uh, division, but we also invest in, in listed stocks. And I always tell my colleagues it's at the moment actually hard to to do a private deal because on the on the listed side you find high quality biotech stocks. Actually, late stage. Yeah, I mean you can argue like if some company's early stage and is still ten years away from a product in times of high interest rates. Yeah, they deserve to have a very low valuation, but you find actually a bunch of 20, 30, really late stage, high quality biotech companies, which are trading at cash, practically have no valuation, so to say. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's hard emotionally at the moment to do venture deals because any venture deal by the nature has a valuation. So what we are seeing in venture is that it's mainly companies where uh, insiders, so existing investors, decide all together to continue investing uh, into the company. But if, if, if non-listed biotech companies have no strong sort of existing shareholder base, it's really hard for them to raise because sort of the peer group, the listed peer group, is trading practically at a zero equity value. I do think personally that it's a huge um, distortion. Uh, for many reasons, um, and that 2024, that's my personal sort of my bet, I would say in 2024, is that the two most successful asset classes will be Bitcoin uh, and listed biotech stocks, because uh, in the moment you see a little bit of a change in interest rates, which I think we're going to down, I mean down, uh, which I think we're going to have in 2024, uh, I think these listed biotech stocks, and especially the ones trading a cash but who have good science uh, uh, and uh, and good potential, they're gonna double, triple, and more. So that's my my personal big bet for 2024 uh, is listed biotech stocks. 
Thank you, Christian. Chris, I see you unmuted yeah, as well. Yeah, this is a really interesting discussion, especially, um, I mean, osteoarthritis is such a big issue with dogs and cats right now. And there's some new interesting uh, medications that have come on the market, um, including Libarilla, Labrilla um, for dogs from Zoetis and also Silencia, which are both uh, monoclonal antibodies, um, which is a really interesting field right now. And both of those have come out from Zoetis, who also came out with Cytopoint, which is an, a monoclonal antibody used to treat um, allergies, itching in dogs, which has been just a phenomenal uh, medication that's given once a month to itchy dogs and works really well. But when coming from an investing standpoint, like what company would I invest in um, as a veterinarian? I think about, I don't know if any of you have played Dungeons and Dragons, but I always bring it back to like, what is the alignment of this company in a Dungeons and Dragons sort of way? Is this a good lawful company? Is this a uh, chaotic good company? Are they are they kind of one that envisions a world with less killing overall, less exploitation of others? What are they willing to do to change current systems? Our, our organization, Our Honor, we kind of consider ourselves sort of a, a chaotic good organization. We follow our conscience. We don't follow the rules. And when we we, we change the rules when the rules are harming others. And so a lot of these companies, I, I kind of am concerned. A company like Zoetis, maybe a uh, evil aligned company. It kind of, it relies on a lot of animal killing and a lot of exploitation of marginalized people. Um, they rely heavily on animal agriculture, which is changing. Um, how and so you kind of have to think about this whole ecosystem how do these companies um how are they dependent on current exploitative animal killing practices zoeta sells a great deal of of their medications to animal agriculture which is in flux right now um, people are reducing their consumption of animal products the the hog industry in the united states which zoetis heavily depends on is definitely in a state of flux. Farms are closing down. Smithfield just moved out of Utah and is shutting their operations down there. Slaughterhouses are closing down because they can't find labor. So I think um, when looking to the future, we have to look at these companies that are aligned um, good and are willing to change the rules. Are they willing to lobby government to get um, to decrease the, the barriers in place um, around animal testing, um, because that's what's needed to be done. There's a future is coming where animals are given more rights and protections, and maybe even rights and protections equal to our own species. So what will that look like in 10, 20 years from now, and where should we be putting our money? Um, and I think we should be putting our money in those companies that envision that future and are kind of aligned to chaotic good. I love your thought. You got to push back against the dark yes. urge. <laughs> John, you had a comment as well before I move on to the next question. Sure. So uh, Crystal brought up some very good points. So one of the things we do is we have a nonprofit organization called PetVivalCares.org, which donates our product to nonprofit organizations to help animals that, you know, get readapted because one of the major reasons why dogs don't get adopted in shelters is lameness issues. And we believe our product will help improve that lameness and improve the quality of life for the animal, as well as we donate our product to people that show a big financial need. And you can go to and look at some of the great videos and stories that are told on there. You know, we have one military family where the three-year-old boy cannot hug the dog because it was in so much pain and on so much medication. And after injecting our product uh, spring, within 30 days, the dog was off of uh, all six of his medications and was playing and wrestling with the boy, which was really moving and made us all feel good. Um, but she mentioned also Zoretis' new monoclonal antibody. So in the last 10 years, there's probably been three innovations in the veterinary space. One is the monoclonal antibody, Labrella and Salentia. So... It is focused, 
the monoclonal is focused basically on blocking the NGF, which is the nerve growth factor. So it's focused on blocking the pain to your brain, basically. Uh, it doesn't do anything to provide long-term protection or protection for the joint. And once again, like I argued with the NSAIDs aspect, when you're just focusing on symptoms, uh, you allow the dog or the cat to get into situations where it normally would not because pain in the human body as well as animal body tells you not to do something. If you don't have that, you're going to do it. And chances are you're going to damage and degrade the joint faster. And that's the major differentiation with with our product is our product is going into the underlying also from a cost standpoint uh the labrella is a monthly injection for the life of the animal for the dog at about 160 dollars a month and it's a usual pay model and for salentia which is for cats and it's a monthly injection it's about 125 dollars our product uh, depending on what part of the country and what needs to be done can range anywhere from 6000 to a, I mean, 600, I'm sorry, to $1,000 for the year. And our product is also covered under pet insurance as the definition of veterinary medical device. The third innovative product is uh, Synovitin, which is a radioactive isotope that gets administered in an area where they have to have protected shielding to administer the isotopes to block, once again, uh, the pain factors. So that's an annual injection or, or treatment, I'm sorry. Uh, and that treatment is have to be done at specialized facilities and it's only FDA cleared for dogs' elbows. So a typical elbow will cost $2,400 for the year. And if you do both elbows, they give you a break. It's on average of 3,000. But once again, that's a focus on the symptom. And our product beyond that is really extending or giving a third option to people that come in with an elderly dog that has osteoarthritis, like a lab that's 12 years old, having difficult pain. And the vet tells the owner, you know, you really have two options. You got to do surgery in an attempt to help this dog. And it's going to cost you seven to eight grand. Or, you know, you put the dog down for $200. Now we're offering an option of using spring, where you're really expanding the life of the joint, most likely that you don't have to have surgery. Plus, you're giving a very relatively inexpensive option where you can extend the quality of life of your dog and your ability to play with your dog for a couple of years more. So, so we, we feel we're really helping dogs and adding to the marketplace. Sorry for the long-winded discussion, but she brought up some very good points. Yeah, and um, if I can jump in, I love the idea of having, having more options available for our patients. Um, and I think interarticular injections, um, like you have are phenomenal things that we can have. Um, but I, I think there's there's a room there's room for both of these things. Um, I always worry about the idea that um, we animals have to feel some sort of pain to prevent them from doing further damage. Um, I think we've gotten a, gotten in a lot of trouble with that belief, and a lot of pain has gone unmanaged. So I, I envision a world where we could use you know both medications, but uh, there's also a problem with. We, we have osteoarthritis that is present in many different joints as a, a, an animal ages, and we might not be able to address every single one of the joints. We might not be able to, to figure out where exactly is the pain coming from. So having something else in addition to intraarticular injections, I think, is, is great. Very good point. Multimodal yeah. approach is the way to go. So if you think about it from an intuitive standpoint, if you're injecting labria, labrella, so you need three injections to know if it's going to be any beneficial, but that's blocking your pain. So if you use our product afterwards, spring, you're actually helping support the underlying structure of the joint. So the combination what you described works, but there's also... Just so it's up to the veterinary doctor to identify what they're most comfortable on a multimodal approach. And as you know, in the industry, generally the vets that do interarticular injections are surgeons, rehab vets, and pain management vets. But 
because of the shortage within the vet industry, these vet or specialized veterinary doctors want the general practitioners to use it. So you're seeing a lot of CE courses being given to general vets and general vets will understand how to do these injections. It's not a difficult injection. So I, I feel we're going to be able to expand the availability of healthcare and bring down the cost of healthcare when we introduce this aspect to the marketplace with the uh, ease, how easy it is really to do interarticular injections. Um, yes, I love it. As a horse person too, I, we're quite used to doing interarticular injections with horses, and I'm glad that this is finally becoming more normalized in dogs and cats too. So that's great. And I, I kind of envision what's the future of researching these new modalities and I would love to see in the future biotech companies partnering with animal shelters to provide access to care, which I, which your company is doing, which is fantastic, um, to more of these, these animals who don't have access to care and can benefit from these new and emerging technologies. And maybe we could help, you know, these new biotech companies can help diagnose some of these animals in shelters. Um, and I think we, we're really going to see a, a transition away from the vivarium model of housing a bunch of animals used for research in cages. And we're going to be doing a lot more research, giving animals the same rights and protections humans get. And we're going to be testing on animals the same way we test on human beings, you know, with consent, with somebody who's advising them of the risks of this, with an advocate. Um, and so we can give them the benefit of these new and emerging biotechnologies without exploiting them, confining them in cages. Um, so that's kind of the, the future I envision, and I, I, hope, I hope other biotech leaders can, can join me in that vision. Well, you know, we're not that far away from each other from the standpoint, like, we have PetVivalCares.org, and the mission of that is to donate to these rescues. And you know, people that can't afford it. Uh, we, we literally do not charge anything for our product when we ship it out to the veterinary doctors to do the injection because uh, the the amount of, you know, emotional feel good for us is very important and knowing that we're helping animals and uh, prolonging the life of animals, but not just prolonging the life, but increasing the quality of life. Thank you, John and Crystal. A lot there and I think a lot in development for both of those points as well. So what I kind of want to touch on here is we spoke a little bit just a few minutes ago, kind of about how investors are viewing the biotech landscape. And before I pick on Christian with kind of a loaded question, Vivi, I'm curious from your point of view as a trader, what are some of the, the key criteria that you look for when you're investing or trading in biotech stocks? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'll pick back what everyone said about, you know, every, every little small cap that anybody bought a year, and a year and a half ago is like down 67%. So what I look it into, um, obviously, to get the risk, I, I look at it to see if any of these companies already have a, a product, you know, that it's been commercialized. So that's, you know, just to, to, as an example, was ARDX because they already had a product, they already had some revenues to then have the money to launch uh, the second product. So it's, it's my long position. But, uh, but for example, what I look at into, uh, we're talking about, I think that those B2 drugs are not really going to survive and people are going to look into uh, a mad need. They're going to look at, at a rare diseases. They're going to look at a cancer. Um, so an another company that, for example, has only a 70 million market cap, it's CKPT, you know, they're coming in with a drug that's going to compete with the Keytruda and it has a bad efficacy and better side effects. So those are the companies that I look at and I try to get really, really early because, uh, for example, CKPT, I got, I'm already 71% up. So if we flop on Pedufa, I'm not really concerned because if I go down 50, 60 percent, I'm still, you know, uh, I'm still going. So I look at it like a year out if I see a really good potential and I see that the company has something that's going to be on a mat need. So, um, for example, uh, I look at a cash because, unfortunately, a lot of these companies are having a hard time to 
um, to get funding. You know, the interest rates are high. Um, completely agree with the, the return on investments. Now these companies are getting swept by big pharma, you know, for a lot cheaper. So they're not seeing the ROI as they used to. And so there's going to be a lot of hostile takeovers. And, and that's why, for example, with the ARDX, I wanted them to go alone for a while so they can prove that they can sell and they can prove, prove a projection. Because what these companies are doing, they're trying to take advantage of the small ones, you know, because it's so hard to get funded and so hard to survive. They'll just come in as, and, and, you know, and give an offer and end up being a hostile takeover. So um, right now, what I'll be looking at is I feel like this is a great opportunity to look at uh, um, companies that are coming in with PDUFAs because the interest rates are going to be, you know, going to soften up in a, in a years from now. I think we've seen the hardest um, so far. So I feel like, uh, just like they were saying on a call, um, I, you know, XBI is down over a hundred percent. So there's so much potential in a small cap right now. Uh, you know, XBI, the high of XBI was, um, $180. So we are 80, 80 bucks. Um, you know, that's the small cap ETF. So we just need to be conscious and looking at the company, how much money, you know, I love to invest when they just didn't done an offering, you know, if they were like six or seven months out from Pedufa, you know, what do they have? How much money they have in hand? Because if you know, if they don't, they ended up going to have to do an offering and they're going to end up having to dilute the stock. So those are the things you need to look for, in, in my opinion. Thank you, Vivian. You actually hit a couple of points that I'm going to follow up on a little later. But before I kick this next question to Christian, John from Biofarm, I'd love your take on the same question as Vivi. Yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly agree with uh, all of Vivi's points, um, certainly about the cash piece. Um, that's something that we track really closely at Biofarm Catalyst is, um, you know, just making sure that we have our estimated live cash up to date. Um, for, for that very reason. I, I mean, I, you know, these companies, it's very hard to get funding. It's the, the producing a drug is extremely expensive um, between R&D, um, actual clinical trial process. It, it is very expensive. And um, for that reason, it is extremely important to pay attention to the runway they have from a cash perspective. I also think that um, one thing that sometimes gets lost in translation and if, if, if some of you folks on the call are more experienced biotech investors, you probably already know this, but if you're more novice, this might be something that is a little bit more interesting to you is the concept of, you know, kind of selling the news, right? And, and this is what we see sometimes, particularly when it comes to approvals. Um, so Vivi mentioned about, you know, Padufa dates, and there are a lot of folks that come to Biofarm Catalyst who like to trade, um, you know, on Padufa dates. Now, the the issue ends up becoming that there's this misconception that you know if the drug gets approved right that that's that's automatically a good thing and that is not necessarily always the case there are and this gets back to vivi's point about conducting the proper due diligence you have to keep in mind is that really an approval all it is in the us is a license it's essentially a license to market the drug right it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually going to be able to sell the drug and so you have you have this scenario where sometimes investors are then wary about, okay, well, the drug was approved, great, but they don't have the sales force to be able to go out and actually market the drug. And that's kind of where we get into a little bit more on licensing agreements and commercialization deals, particularly for the smaller biotech companies and why that ends up being you know a huge benefit for them. Because for some of these companies, I mean, we're really talking about two, three, four, you know, scientists that are developing this drug, right, for, for these very, very small companies. Um, and I just think that that's something that, you know, you do see people get burned on it. Um, and, and sometimes what we tell folks is, you know, you might want to think about taking a look at the run up, right? Like before the cat, and that's why we track the catalyst at Biofarm Catalyst the way we do before a particular event of phase three data release of Padufa, sometimes you'll see investors get into that trade, right? And start investing in the, in the stock before uh, the actual event takes place and then try to, you know, like get out of the position before, uh, before the actual date occurs because they don't want to be caught on the wrong side of the trade. Because at the end of the day, you know, you might have a good sense of the science and you might have um, you might have done some due diligence, but at the end of the day, it's the FDA's call, right? We, we, it kind of is 
a little bit of a gamble sometimes when it comes to whether or not it's going to be a hit or a miss uh, from a data release or approval standpoint. We, we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know that information. So I just wanted to offer that up in terms of conducting as much due diligence as you can and just thinking about the way that you're actually approaching, you know, investing in these companies. I'd say that's a pretty sound take, John. Thank you. Now, to kind of take another spin here, we did touch a little bit on the concept of, you know, valuations, returns on biotech. And I just wanted to pick on you a little bit here, Christian, on this one. According to a report by Tech Navio, the global biotech market size is estimated to grow by $3.65 billion. Uh, at a compound annual growth rate of 3.01 percent between 2023 and 2028, and of that, North America is projected to account for roughly 45 percent of that growth. So, with the North American region accounting for nearly half of growth in that time frame, again 2023 to 2028, biotech companies increasingly engage in global collaborations. Now, Christian, how do the how do investors view these partnerships and kind of what trends are you seeing this year in 2023 now, two years after the estimated boom? Uh, what kind of trends are you seeing? Are they kind of on an uptick globally or staying the same? Which kind of partnerships you mean? Like so like just global partnerships between companies in terms of research and development, potential global mergers, acquisitions. Just kind of curious how you're seeing seeing how any intercompany collaborations globally are kind of seeming in 2023 going into 2024. We need two answers. Many, if, if you mean like, because you said like 45%, you can say, especially I mean, it's a high number, but you could say like there's half of, uh, of the growth coming from rest of the world. Yeah. But like, sort of, if I look at our biotech companies, um, it's still America is the our North American market is the, the defining sort of market. So then you have Europe um, and practically very little people look at Asia and especially China because of patterns are hard, partnerships are hard. So, so if, if, if your question is, are a lot of biotech companies seeking out international development partnerships by giving away rights, for example, to China. At least I haven't seen it not happening. J Japan, yes. So I would say it's practically that the markets which are relevant for drug development for future for future revenues is, is the US, is Europe and Japan. That's it. Uh, and then you have some countries like whatever, the UAE, Saudi, whatever, Australia, who all follow FDA approval. But the big sort of what a lot of people were talking about, the big market China um, has not materialized, neither as I see it as a market, nor have I seen any meaningful big corporations, I don't know, between Chinese uh, biotech companies and, and American ones for shared IP and, and shared development. Um, so what is literally over the last weeks uh, starting to happen, which the whole biotech world was waiting for, is pharma companies buying, um, uh, taking over M&A in, in biotech companies. So if you look at the, the, the war chest pharma companies have, it's at an all-time high. So pharma companies sitting at billions and billions of money and most of the money makers, um, so the existing money makers for the big pharma companies are actually running out of, uh, of patents. So they need a new pipeline. Yeah, and yesterday, um, Cerebral was acquired with a big premium um, some, uh, some days before um, Abri bought Immunogen. So that, and it, it's actually fairly late, so people expected it uh, to happen earlier, but it is starting. And that is normally this one of the reasons uh, why I'm so bullish uh, about the biotech market is normally the sign that sort of the market turns because all these, I mean, uh, all these acquisitions um, happened at uh, at big premium. So I just pulled it up into a, like sort of the the M and A money earmarked in uh, for in pharma companies for M and A is more than five hundred billion globally, which is supposed or will flow into the biotech market over the next one or two years. Yeah, and that is already will boost the market uh, significantly. 
Thank you, Christian. And just kind of as a really quick follow up here, uh, with the recent success of, you know, companies like the Danish weight loss company, Novo Nordisk, have you seen kind of any trends in that direction or any changes for similar companies to Novo Nordisk? Do you think that they're, you know, an outlier of success or is this something that we can see continue? No, no. So first of all, <laughs> that's my favorite question, because like I think actually the success of uh, Ozempic, which is the famous weight loss drug uh, Novo, Nord Novo Nordisk is producing, by the way, I'm on it uh, and it's amazing <laughs> because you do lose weight and it's actually very healthy. So it's a it's a weight loss mechanism um, or a weight management mechanism. And at the same time, it's very protective or very good for your cardiovascular health. It's very protective against cancer. So it's actually one of the, if you want to call it like that, one of the true first, you could say, longevity drugs because it is helping you avoiding many age-related diseases. And at the same time, uh, it's a vanity product. So what is interesting, and that is actually, I think, the biggest change we're going to see over the next uh, two, three years in biotech. What is interesting with Ozempic is that people like I are not the people who are supposed to take it. So people think Ozempic is approved for weight management. It's not. It's approved for weight loss for clinically obese people. Yeah, and I'm hopefully not clinically obese. So I don't know the exact number, but I would expect that it's 80, 90% of the people who use Ozempic are using it, what is legally called off-label. So it's an approved medication. They get it from their doctor but they are not the supposed group of people who should take it. Why is this so important? Because over the last 20 years, and it's literally, I started my career in biotech uh, as a founder in, two, uh, in uh, 1999, so a while ago, uh, over the last 20, 25 years, I was always super interested in off-label use because like we do also other, um, uh, we do consumer tech, we do other things than biotech in my investment firm. And in any other company, the most important sort of buzzword is always TAM, total addressable market. So in any other company, you want to produce a product which is taken by as many or consumed by as many people as possible. Biotech, what well, is the opposite? If you look at the last 20, 30 years, the top selling drugs in biotech are used by less and less people because biotech became more and more niche was focusing more and more on rare diseases, orphan drugs, and all of that. Thank you, Christian. I think a lot of good points to make there as well. And, and it, it was also really curious to me with this advent of Ozempic being utilized now for weight loss, uh, off-label as it were, uh, that something similar, this kind of boom, it was surprising to me that it didn't happen such as, you know, the loss, the off-label rather use of you know, oral finasteride, oral minoxidil for male pattern baldness, which is something that's been going on for, you know, the better part of two decades now. Uh, but really good points to make there, Christian. Thank you. I was going to John... add something oh, to it. Um, so what happened is they, they start doing Ozempic because for some reason, Wagovi, which is also said my uh, tide, um, is indicated for weight loss, but it's exactly the same molecule as the Ozempic, but it's a lot more expensive. The insurance companies are not paying for so what if they decided to go through a different route if you had a slightly increase on your you know on your blood sugars they were actually prescribing ozempic for weight loss and what happened is it's supposed to be to people with a have bmi over 30 but now in this case you know became the hollywood and miami everybody started using ozempic for uh, weight loss but there is already you know a drug four way laws, but it is the same molecule, just with a different name. So, but I, I wanted just to point it out that Eli Lilly has Monjaro, which is even better in my opinion than Ozempic. And is also people are using that off label. And then autoimmune ALT just went up, I don't know, 200%, 100%, uh, 200% was on my calls. They just came out with another weight loss that's supposed to be even better because there's the downside to Ozempic. You know, uh, people have a problems with GI, there's increase of uh, cancer and, and um, uh, thyroid cancer if you're prone to it. Um, people have a really dislike about the food and people can throw up and be very nauseated. So I think the market is huge. And as we come up with the competition, 
I think it's just going to heat up pharma even more. You know, look at a Lily, Eli Lily right now, because of Mongero, it's, it's almost $700 stock, you know? Thank you, Vivian. Uh, John, I actually have real quick here as a small sidebar. I have a question from one of our listeners today. J uh, James Garrison asked, what would be the human equivalent of spring? He saw their promo materials mentioned adapting human solutions to companion animals. If it's the same as a quote unquote knee replacement, how well do these animals handle post operative physical therapy? And he's wondering if spring is comparable to cortisone. Well, it's actually way beyond cortisone. So what we have seen the veterinary surgeons use is use our product in two ways after surgery, after TPL surgery. Basically, one, they inject it into the surgical area to allow stability and faster rehab. Generally, a dog goes through rehab after the surgery. You know, it's probably 90 to 120 days with the spring product we have seen in real world applications that's greatly reduced almost up to 50 percent now here's the interesting component bilateral joint injection to prevent a future surgery so what happens is once you have the surgery the bilateral joint has additional stress and pressure put on it and hence probably close to 80 percent within the next 12 months will require a surgery on the bilateral joint our product will help protect that joint. And we have seen that uh, in a high percentage, they did not have to have a future surgery on the bilateral joint. So it's a major cost savings. Uh, the veterinary doctors that are doing the surgery like it because it's something they can offer their client uh, that will help shorten the, the uh, rehab time and improve the, the likelihood of not needing a secondary surgery caused by the original surgery. And I'll just say that's huge because we found that 70% of dogs who get TPLO surgeries need surgery in the other leg um, at some point. So if we could prevent yep. that from happening. That's huge. I We had this wonderful English bulldog in the shelter who uh, we, we paid for the TPLO surgery and luckily adopted him out to a wonderful um, adopter who, and then he needed a second surgery in the other leg. And, and thankfully the, the adopter had made a lot of money in Bitcoin. And so it was no problem <laughs> and uh, was able to get the surgery done. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's huge and that's fantastic. Yeah, we definitely need to talk. Our nonprofits have to talk to your nonprofit yes. because we would love to donate syringes out to your profit to help these dogs get adopted. Like I said before, one of the most re reasons why people don't adopt the dog is the lameness issue. And if we can help improve that, we're going to get these dogs adopted out into the into great families. We should definitely connect because I, could, I know a lot yep. of dogs who could definitely benefit from that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I wanted to comment on the Ocentric and the uh, Lily product. So, um, you know, it, insurance companies is the key driver to how successful a product's going to be. And the, the, the products are approved for diabetic care. And I think what you're going to see is a lot of the human doctors will start prescribing to pre-diabetics and that would probably be covered because if you're trying to get it for weight loss, you're not going to get it. It's going to cost you probably around 1200 to 1500 a month. That's very expensive. So, so I feel, you know, th the insurance companies will allow for it because they're going to be saving money in the long run because, uh, you know, obesity is the number one contributor to cancer, diabetics, heart conditions, so we can reduce the risk factors for each one of those. It's going to save the healthcare industry a lot of, a lot of money over the years. And, and that's, you know, with our product, I've been talking to the insurance companies to use as a prophylactic for certain breeds of dogs. It's like French bulldogs at age three or four, they get shoulder issues, labs, hip dysplasia, and so on. And, you know, so, but the insurance companies are still at the mindset, you know, do a diagnosis of a problem before we'll go and pay for it. And, and I feel there's going to be a lot of benefits as there's more education out there, more vets and people will be interested in using the spring product 
as a prophylactic to prevent the joint from future damage, as well as preventing onsets of certain conditions. I love it. Um, and the cost of veterinary care is such a huge issue now. And the cost of human health care in general is such a huge issue. And I would love to see biotech leaders kind of coming to the forefront and solving these problems, lobbying government because they have the power and the connections with our legislators. How can we help fund healthcare for all species, not just humans? Like, let's solve, this is a major problem that needs to be solved. Um, so how can we, we decrease the cost of healthcare for all species? maybe provide public funding, maybe some of these billion trillion dollar corporations can pay their fair share to pay for health care for all of the beings on this planet because we're all interconnected. All of lives is interconnected. Um, so I would love to, to hear more about some ideas for how we can deal with some of these concerns that capitalism has brought on. Thank you. Both. So I do want to get John at Biofarm jumping in here as well. First, do you have any comments on what was said so far? And then a couple of folks did mention a few things kind of on the topic of global investment earlier in the panel. Uh, John from Biofarm, how has the global investment scene kind of developed this year? For example, I know I think it was Christian mentioned investment in Chinese biotech groups. An article by Financial Times noted that those investments specifically, those in Chinese biotech groups have fallen over 50% in the last two years. And I was just wondering from your point of view, and then maybe Christian as a follow-up on there as well, uh, has this been the case elsewhere? Or is that kind of, is that kind of just condensed into that 50% drop in Chinese investment from North Americans? So, I mean, from our perspective, we definitely saw that within China. Um, I think that, you know, I, I would say that generally speaking, I mean, the concentration still remains pretty high within uh, within the United States. From our perspective, we don't really deal too much in the way of, um, you know, in the way of foreign markets. So pretty much everything that we're uh, we're doing um, and, and the companies that we're covering are going to be all um, US based, uh, US based companies. Now, having said that, um, I think that you've seen a, sh a shift over the years, uh, in terms of like where the actual trials are taking place. Right. And that could also be, that could also be a factor, right? So, uh, whether or not, I mean, if you're talking about the approvals, like being like not getting approved in, you know, EMEA or elsewhere, um, I don't have as much of a comment on that. I would say that the, 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 and the big driver still seems to be from at least everything that I've seen, mainly the FDA and the U S markets. Um, although my guess is that that likely is true, you know, in the post COVID era, but we certainly have seen new and innovative ways of, um, of, you know, the way clinical trials are being conducted. Um, and, and I think one interesting point on that is the fact that there's a lot less of a need for folks to, um, you know, actually go to active clinical trial sites. This may have been, again, a, a result of COVID, but there's more technologies that are actually bringing, you know, the drugs to patients um, in, in order for them to do it in their house or, or whatever it is. Um, and I think that that's going to be a really cool, um, you know, something that's going to really, really develop. But yeah, as far as like, if, if you're referring to more whether the drug was, you know, approved in China versus approved in, um, you know, I, I, ha I hadn't seen anything specifically that indicated any markets. I did see the China stat, but I didn't see anything specifically um, that referred to uh, some of the, 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 the approvals in, in other foreign markets. And like I said, it still seems like the, you know, kind of the main driver for, for most investors is, is, is within the U.S. and the FDA. Thank you, John. Christian, is there anything that you maybe wanted to add to that? No, honestly, that was exactly what I've said as well. Like uh, the U.S. is the main driver, then Europe, then a little bit Japan. Uh, U.S. plus all the markets which follow U.S. approval. Um, yeah. well, thank you much. So I want to touch on kind of one more broader topic here. Um, in September of this year, the FDA actually announced new steps to further modernize evaluation and support for the development of innovative veterinary products 
and increase regulatory flexibility and efficiency, as well as address unmet needs in veterinary medicine. So I want to start here with you, John, because one could easily say that Pet Vivo strives to meet these needs. But John, could you kind of provide other examples of unmet needs in veterinary medicine and addressing the lack of targeted therapeutics designed and approved for use in animals? And then I would also love to get Dr. Crystal's take on that as a follow-up as well. So there are many areas, you know, some in the agriculture, you know, when you transport cows, horses, and chickens uh, with the standard trucks, the diesel and the exhaust actually gets into the lungs and causes tremendous inflammation and breathing issues within these agriculture animals as well as sports animals in terms of horses. So there is quite a bit of death that occurs there. And um, I'm, I'm seeing an unmet need there uh, or, or, or an economical unmet need. There, there, there's a lot of things that can be solved, but it's not economical to solve. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be innovations in multiple areas going forward uh, because with us, we have a lot of clinical data on the human side. So, so we're kind of unique. A lot of work was done on the human side because of the NIH and DOD funding. So like in the case we have uh, of urinary incontinence, we basically have taken pigs and injected our particles into the sphincter muscle, and it basically strengthened the sphincter muscle by 6x, and we saw the stopping of urinary incontinence in pigs. We totally believe that can be brought over to the animal side, you know, for treating dog urinary incontinence, and then eventually into the human market, because it's, it's a very large market in the human side, as well as in the animal side. I mean, you're seeing companies like Kimberly Clark uh, that makes the Depends and so on. Uh, the majority of, well, I shouldn't say majority, but a big chunk of their revenues come from products like that. So we feel we have plenty of opportunities to bring these other products along based on the existing data we have and how wide the patents are. So we're, we're excited for the next five to 10 years, not just us, but within the industry of a lot of developments in the companion animal side that can later be translated into the human side of the marketplace. Thank you, John. Crystal, I would love your take uh, for what you're seeing from, from a practicing veterinarian on this topic as well. Yeah, I mean, and John brings up a really great point about animal agriculture and the unmet needs there. And we, we really have to talk about what does, what does the future hold when we have to feed 10 billion people when half our land is already going to feeding animals that we eat and, you know, most of the calories that we end up feeding to animals then get wasted. Only 10% of the calories that we feed to these animals end up becoming food that we actually eat. So a lot of land is wasted. One third of our arable land is going to feed animals. This then creates a lot of um, problems with you have infectious disease, you have um, spillover events that occur as we we deforest areas to grow or to create more arable land to feed livestock. So I think a lot of these new emerging technologies that create protein using slaughter free methods, um, we're going to see a, a rapid scaling down of animal agriculture in the coming years very shortly. A lot of the biotech companies um, do rely on animal agriculture and their byproducts. Those are going to be disrupted. The, the funding that, that goes to these companies um, that, that make profit from selling to animal agriculture is, is, going to be, um, is going to be disrupted too. So there's going to be a huge shakeup here in the next few years. Um, and I, I you know, foresee um, in the future with um, pharmaceutical companies partnering directly with, like me and John are going to partner hopefully with our shelter and, and providing treatment. And maybe we could even collaborate on some research and development of products in the future, um, providing access to care to homeless animals and also animals whose people can't afford this sort of, these advanced treatments. So we're going to develop these new technologies, um, giving back instead of 
in an exploitative way. We're going to see a, a rapid scaling down of vivariums and these companies, um, one of them being Science Corp in, in my area in Alameda, really, really had met with um, some challenges by the local community when they tried to purchase or they tried to lease property in Alameda and the community did not want to see their property leased to a, a giant company that was going to house and confine animals in labs. And so they didn't allow it. And um, that was a blow to Science Corp. And, and we also kind of exposed that Max Hodek, the CEO, previously worked for Neuralink. Neuralink made the news because of their um, cruel treatment of monkeys and the death of 12 monkeys um, under their care. These are going to be huge issues um, as we have more compassion for animals. I think there's going to be a big shakeup and hopefully we'll see pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies changing the way they look at things, addressing government um, in they're, the way that they regulate these things and the way they approve drugs, a much more streamlining process where animals are considered given the rights and protections that humans are given. Um, and so I hope that many of the leaders sort of are leading the charge in that and starting these dialogues alongside of activists in making these changes and so that we can really streamline the cost of research and development. Um, there's not so much waste with um, these endless mouse model studies and studies on animals that are confined in really unnatural settings that don't end up translating to other species and to humans. Um, so I really look forward to, to a lot of the different changes that will occur. And the companies that are sticking to the status quo are not going to be successful in the future. Um, those companies who are, are seeking to change things, seeking to change the way we fund um, research and the way we approve drugs are gonna be the ones who are le leading the charge and the ones to invest in. Really curious to see how things develop on that front. Thank you, Crystal. So kind of what I wanna do here to kind of just really drive us home is I'm just going to kind of go through the panelists here and I'd love for you to kind of give any commentary that you have on what's been said and if you have something that you feel is really important that we didn't get a chance to touch on today please feel free to touch on that as well so let's go ahead and start here with you Christian if you don't mind yeah, with pleasure. First of all, I wanted to say like what Crystal said and echo that. I think, uh, meaning I think we all can agree that animal farming is uh, is a. It sounds a little bit uh, um, um, not emotionless, but I come to the more emotion point and say, but animal farming is highly inefficient. Yeah, taking um, uh, taking um, uh, greens or whatever, stuffing it into animals to get meat is is a very inefficient process to make meat. Um, animal farming hasn't changed over the last some thousand years, so it's a very ancient, uh, non-disrupted uh, method to produce food for humans. And obviously, it's super brutal uh, and unethical, so we should get rid of it. Um, so what is the option? I just want to repeat, because I think it was a very good point Crystal made. Obviously, people could go vegetarian or vegan. It's just very unrealistic that 7 billion people because of cultural background and whatever. Yeah, and actually, I personally, I think from a nutrition point of view, fish, if we include fish and meat and whatever, a little bit of it is actually very healthy. So I'm a huge believer, and we have a lot of companies in our portfolio uh, in synthetic biology. So practically doing what an animal is doing, which you could say uh, uh, any form of, of being is just like a bioreactor taking in energy, sun, any form of input and, and growing and, and transforming it into meat and other stuff. Yeah, so we are able, we are in the meantime able to both produce meat, fish, dairy, all of it in, in a bioreactor. It sounds so artificial, but it's actually the same natural process, but without any animal uh, being harmed. And what, I, what I'm seeing across our portfolio and others, these products are now getting actually cheaper or at least at the same price level as animal grown meat and and fish grown uh fish uh so i think in two three years already uh the world will completely change which by the way would be a big disruption for societies because still a lot of people um are dependent being farmers uh, and i think let's say latest in five to ten years from now i don't think we will have 
animal harvested fish, meat, dairy, but all lab produced. And I think it's a great thing. It's also more healthy because it's clean. You don't have all the antibiotic shit and all of that. So I just wanted to echo that, that I think that's an extremely important positive development, both for animal rights um, and actually for human health. And then we can actually, by the way, feed much more people. So that whole idea that we are too many people on this planet is, in my point of view, completely wrong. I think we could add billions of people if we rethink how we feed these people, how energy is produced, and all of that. We're just making so many mistakes in food production, in energy production. And this is why we have the feeling that too many people are rather burdened. I think we have space, we have resources, we have everything. We just need to innovate certain parts of our economies which haven't been innovated like the food production for thousands of years. Um, yeah, so that's just my point there. And then I just want to reiterate, I think biotech in general, I love it because like every time any biotech company, either in the human space or in the, in the animal space is successful, you're doing something good. I'm always jokingly saying I'm doing very little charity because biotech can be both at once. You can make tons of money uh, and you're doing really good for humanity because if it's a cream which helps skin problems or if it's a cancer treatment, every time a biotech company is successful, a certain group of people um, is helped, which is, I think, a very fulfilling thing or a very fulfilling attribute uh, biotech, investing in biotech has. Uh, I think biotech has suffered a lot the last two years, I think unreasonably. Yeah, uh, there was a, obviously a rising interest rates. You can make the case that biotech stocks should have gone down, but I think they gone down way, way, way too much, as I said before. Uh, and that's why I just can repeat as a, my closing remarks, I think biotech will be the best uh, asset class of 2024. Thank you, Christian. Next, John from Biopharma. Any closing thoughts here? Anything we didn't touch on or anything you've got coming out people should check out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first off, I just wanted to thank everybody on the call. I thought that was a, a really, really great discussion. Um, and and I certainly, you know, learned a lot from from all the experts in this space as well. Um, but, you know, I kind of just wanted to just touch on, you know, just because this is our specialty is more just areas of, you know, more areas of thought kind of coming up because uh, we obviously we cover, you know, we cover thousands of drugs and catalysts within our, our, uh, within our database and just wanted to give people a lens into kind of some of the things that we were thinking about. I, I certainly agree with Christian's comments around mental health. Uh, one area in particular, uh, actually Christian, we, we, we do cover, you guys are uh, definitely within our database, um, a tie and uh, definitely familiar with you guys for the psychedelic stuff. I, I would, agree that that is definitely a space that uh to watch moving forward um along those same lines i would also mention you know alzheimer's um that was obviously in the news a little bit over the summer uh with the biogen um uh the biogen drug um but i think that that's going to be something to uh to really watch moving forward uh, because that was you know one of the first beta targeting drugs of its kind um, and I think you're going to, you know, you're going to see a lot more. We've got some catalysts coming up with Eli Lilly, uh, Anovis, um, Cassava Sciences uh, in, in 2024. So that's definitely something to take a look at. Uh, we did touch on obesity, um, certainly uh, something to, to also watch moving forward. Um, I know uh, Thera Technologies, uh, THTX has a Padufa coming up in January for excess uh, patients with excess fat um, who, who have HIV. Um, so there's a couple things uh, along that front that I would um, encourage folks to look at. Um, and then just from from our general standpoint, um, you know, what, uh, as far as what we're, we've been working on, we, you know, our, our platform is a subscription based platform, um, you know, but if you sign up, you get a seven day free trial, regardless of the plan type. We did just launch a brand new plan called our Elite Plus plan within the last week. Um, so I did want to just mention that if anyone was interested in getting more information on Catalyst or, um, you know, checking us out, you get a seven day free trial with that as well. And we have added some options data um, and a couple other cool reports um, that our team is producing in house that are only available to those customers. So we're really just looking to expand our platform and just try to give 
you know, you guys as much as you can uh, from a, from a data standpoint. And um, you know, hopefully our main goal is to make sure that you guys are never behind the curve on, on any of this stuff and get hit with a surprise when, uh, when, uh, when any of this data or any of this information is released. So that's, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, John. And thanks for coming. Definitely check that out, folks. Next, Crystal, any closing thoughts here? Anything working on that people should check out? Um, yeah, one closing thought. Um, Humane Farming Association founder Bradley Miller said, teaching a child not to step on a caterpillar is as valuable to the child as it is to the caterpillar. We just had on Dr. Andrew Knight on our honors um, YouTube channel. You can check us out at our honor vets um, on Twitter and our honor.org. Dr. Knight was talking about slaughter free pet foods for dogs and cats. So that will really disrupt the whole animal agriculture exploitative um, thing that's happening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I love where the future is headed if we all kind of have a positive attitude about it and thinking about the best interest of others no matter their species we have so many opportunities here and so many areas of harm to disrupt and change um, and i hope that companies can join us in doing that and dismantling some of these destructive systems. Yes, I love the idea of um, improving everybody's happiness. Um, so check us out at ourhonor.org and at, on Twitter at, at ourhonorvets. John, do you have anything you wanted to add here at the end? Anything else that Pet Vivo may have in the pipeline that people should know about before we send sure. people off into the end of their day? Yeah, so I want to hit two key points. One is what Christian talked about, the performance of the market. And then second, I believe it was John talking about just getting approval doesn't mean automatic success of their product. So I'm going to attack the, uh, tackle the first one. Um, earlier on, I talked about the relative performance of the S&P 500 and the XBI, which is the small cap biotech and ETF. Uh, if you look at the daily chart on it, the low on the XBI was put in uh, early or late October, early November, and you've seen the relative breakout in a short period of time within a little over 30 days. The technical charts broke above the 50-day and the 200-day moving average. Uh, and that's usually, this is a could be a major long-term trend move. And that's why I agree with Christian that 2024, this could be the number one sector in terms of performance. Now, if you look at the Pet Vivo chart, it's pretty much starting to take that type of same shape, but it's 30 days later. So hopefully we see it across the board in many other companies. And I believe it was John's statement about just getting approval doesn't mean you could have success. And he's absolutely correct. So what we did at Pet Vivo is try to focus on putting all the pieces and building the foundation for success when certain things happen. So if you look at the experience of the management team at Pet Vivo, our marketing director, uh, 45 years experience with Zoetis and Berger Ingerheim, the number one and two players in the world in the veterinary space. Um, sales director, 27 years at Zoetis as one of the top uh, territorial managers. My licensing uh, distribution executive, 42 years experience, former president of Animal Health International, took that from 30 million. That company went to eventually 900 million a year in sales. So we, we have really taken the time and laid this foundation out. And if you look at our scientific team, they're, they're tremendous, multiple years of experience, ranked by major publications as top experts in their respective fields. So, so we, we definitely echo what John said. But on top of that, we have an exclusive distribution agreement with MWI Animal Health to distribute our product. And they're the number one players pretty much uh, in the world. In the, in the United States, they do $5 billion a year in veterinary animal distribution. 90% of veterinary doctors have accounts with them. They have 400 territorial managers and 300 in-house salespeople. And we're able to surround those territorial managers with our regional business development people that each one of them have over 20 years experience working with Merck Animal Health, Berger, Ingerheim, and so on. So, so we're very excited 
of the future for pet fever and the multiple catalysts that we have coming up in the next 120 days. We have major trade shows where a lot of our science as well as key podium speakers will be talking about our product. And, and, and we actually had some very good peer review articles in today's veterinary practice that we didn't even know was happening. We had one, Dr. Tammy Grubb. She's the new president of International uh, Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. She talked about our product should be looked at as first use. Uh, and then also our product should be looked at as alternatives for dogs that can't take NSAIDs. There's about 83 million dogs within the United States, and 5% of those dogs can't take NSAIDs. Our product actually offers a lot more benefits from the standpoint of not having side effects, being able to be covered under pet insurance, and as an alternative is probably the cheapest option out there in the marketplace. So I just wanted to lay that out that John raised very good points on not automatic approval doesn't mean, when you get approval doesn't mean automatic success. Thank you, John. And again, thank you to all of our panelists today. It was a very informative panel. I learned a lot personally and all the comments and stuff, you know, peer reviewed research coming out, research and development. I'm a former external IRB coordinator. So I'd love to hear, I love to hear about, you know, in-depth reviews of any medical advancements that are being worked on. For those of you who came in late, again, this was sponsored by Pet Vivo. We are joined today by John Lai, the CEO, President, and Director of Pet Vivo, to give his expertise on how biotech vet med is advancing. If you came in late, fret not. This will be released later today as a new episode of the Unusual Whales podcast on both Spotify and Apple, as well as YouTube. Stay tuned for Unusual Whales' next space. It will be next Wednesday, following, excuse me, before and following the FOMC presser with Jerome Powell. So that'll be next Wednesday. Other than that, folks, thank you for spending your time with us here today, learning about biotech and vet med and their intersections with the markets. Thank you to John, John, Crystal, Christian, and Vivi for joining us today. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, all.